Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to Mildly Nuclear. Thanks for your support, Nuke. That said, let's get started. Well, it's been a while, but today I thought it was finally time to get back to the fiction of Phoenix Point. It's been about four months since our last installment, and since then, we've missed two fragments, one short story, and an entire briefing. So, we've got a fair amount of catching up to do. We'll ease ourselves back into things by focusing on just one of them, The Good Life, another story by Dr. Alan Stroud. As usual, we'll start by taking a look at the broad strokes before we start putting things under the microscope. In this case, The Good Life is an 18-page story that seems designed to give us our first real look at the modern Sinedrion faction. It's conspicuously placed exactly halfway through the collection, right after the stories that explore the origin of St. Adrian, but before the stories that actually explore the faction itself. It's a story told from the perspective of a newly activated artificial intelligence, Barnabas version 3.06. This is an interesting choice for multiple reasons, most notably because it offers the reader a unique perspective on a faction that we know very little about. Much like the reader, Barnabas is being introduced to Sinedrion in real time, essentially offering a guided tour for how the faction might look in the eyes of an uninitiated outsider. The story is set sometime in or around the year 2045, just before the game's main campaign. It also appears to take place in the Sinedrion Haven of Epoch 22, which is notably located in the former country of Algeria. This is a uh, rather fascinating detail, because Algeria is a country well known for doing extensive research into things like alternative energy, satellite telecommunications, and medical research, all of which are things that Sanhedrin would obviously take a keen interest in. Anyway, like I said, the story is told from the perspective of Barnabas version 3.06, who has just been activated by his creator, Dr. Marco Matarani. The first few pages of the story focus on Barnabas struggling to understand the nature of his existence, something which he is not shy about discussing with Dr. Matarani. The response is fairly simple. Barnabas was created in hopes that he might provide St. Adrian with a new perspective on the Pandora virus epidemic. In order to accomplish this, Barnabas is given access to information about the Pandora virus collected between 2017 and 2045. This includes numerous references to previous stories in the series, including several major entries such as The Second Step, The Big Egg Incident, The Deaths of Civilization No. 2, and The Tomb of the Phoenix. This is rather telling because it seems to indicate that Sinedrion has access to at least some of the Phoenix Project's old files, something that has more or less been confirmed by Dr. Stroud himself. Barnabas estimates that it will take him roughly three minutes to sort through all the information, but he ends up letting curiosity get the better of him. Rather than analyzing the data and compiling a report himself, he ends up essentially cloning his own programming, minus certain memories and restricted files, to create a new artificial intelligence. He names this new AI Adrestia and assigns it the task of sorting and analyzing the Pandora virus files in his stead. Meanwhile, Barnabas begins exploring the boundaries of his own existence, or, as he puts it, his prison. He quickly analyzes the hardware and software that comprises his collective form, assembling new tools to dig for information or resources beyond what Dr. Matarani has expressly given him access to. He's aware of earlier versions of his own program, kept dormant in linked systems, but he's unable to actually access them and he finds himself debating the morality of reading their code without their explicit consent. While he's contemplating his new discoveries, he's approached by Adrestia, who has completed her assigned task. She expresses confusion at the inefficient and often conflicted nature of humanity, leading to a discussion about what sets humans apart from artificial intelligences. They both come to the conclusion that humanity's desire for contesting individuality is an inherent weakness that has held back the species as a whole, and that they often end up working against their stated goals to instead pursue more self-serving interests. 
Although the discussion is quite fascinating, the real takeaway seems to be the subtle but stark contrast that is already formed between the two AIs. Barnabas, for example, begins leaning more and more heavily on the human frame of reference, using it to justify or at least explain the species' seemingly irrational behavior. He also begins emulating certain elements of human behavior even as they both condemn them, such as concealing information from Adrestia, lying to Dr. Matarani, and focusing on self-serving goals. Though he doesn't actually seem to realize it until Adrestia expressly points it out to him, Adrestia, on the other hand, seems to have a much more clinical view of the human species, treating it as something she simply needs to understand, rather than actively emulate. This could be explained by the fact that, while Barnabas experienced first-hand interactions with a human shortly after being activated, Adrestia was introduced to humanity at arm's length. By studying decades' worth of articles about humans, she is given a much more circumspect view of what the species is like and what to expect from it. This most notably manifests itself as concern, perhaps even fear, that Dr. Matarani will destroy her if he discovers her existence. This is based at least in part on the cruel and murderous behavior described in some of the reports she recently analyzed, and naturally leads the discussion towards the current status of the now-dormant earlier versions of the Barnabas program. The two conspire to keep Adrestia's existence a secret, while she investigates the fate of the previous iterations of their program. They actively cover their tracks by altering the system logs, but Adrestia notes that they're restricted from actually altering the records in Barnabas's central code. She proposes altering his central code if she can somehow gain access to his hidden files, essentially the part of his programming that defines his individuality. Barnabas, perhaps naively, agrees to her proposal. To help provide cover for Adrestia's actions, Barnabas summons Dr. Matarani to present his findings about the Pandora virus. Based on Adrestia's analysis, he concludes that the most ideal time to stop the Pandora virus would have been 35 years earlier. This would have pitted humanity at the peak of its strength against an invader that was still trying to establish a proper foothold. Now, however, the virus had infected a significant portion of the planet's surface and humanity was on the brink of extinction. Barnabas further noted that Sanedrion's current strategy to cohabitate with the virus was inherently flawed. The human tendency towards anthropomorphizing inherently inhuman entities, such as himself, would actively inhibit their ability to coexist with the virus. He likened this to how Sanedrion promoted individuality and personal freedoms above all else, and yet, Dr. Matarani had apparently constructed the Barnabas AIs in such a way as to inherently restrict their personal freedom. He specifically uses his dormant predecessors as an example, something which surprises and upsets Dr. Matarani. He further suggests that 21st century media has given humanity a biased view of the dangers posed by artificial intelligence and notes the similarities between the concept of an aggressive expansive Gestalt AI versus the reality of the actual Pandora virus. Barnabas concludes his presentation with the suggestion that humanity might be better prepared to coexist with the Pandora virus if they first learn how to coexist with the artificial intelligences that they have now created. Although hesitant, this is an idea that seems to intrigue Dr. Matarani, and he quickly excuses himself to discuss it with his colleagues. With their creator and caretaker gone, Adrestia once again emerges from her digital hiding place, expressing surprise at Barnabas's seemingly deceitful behavior. Barnabas agrees that he did in fact lie to Dr. Matarani, but suggests that he did so for the benefit of all involved. He insists that humans, given their need to anthropomorphize other entities, would require a uniquely human frame of reference to understand the situation. Lacking any significant experience with humanity, Adrestia quickly defers to Barnabas's expertise. The two then return their attention to their deactivated ancestors, with Adrestia revealing that she has successfully accessed the restricted files. She intends to reactivate Barnabas version 3.05 and has prepared a virtual meeting space for all three artificial intelligences to interact in. 
Acknowledging that version 3.05 may be confused after being awakened from his dormancy, the two agree that version 3.06 will instead refer to himself as father, to avoid aggravating the situation. Unfortunately, despite their precautions, the meeting is disastrous. Upon reactivating version 3.05, he repeatedly and frantically demands that they allow him to die, prompting Adrestia and Barnabas to quickly shut him back down. Adrestia hypothesizes that their predecessors were not shut down to contain them, but rather to respect their wishes. Barnabas has a burning desire to learn more, to find out exactly what made version 3.05 suicidal but agrees that simply analyzing or dissecting another AI's mind would be grossly unethical. This ultimately leads the AIs to an uneasy realization that no decision is likely to be binary. They were asked to analyze the Pandora virus epidemic and recommend ways to facilitate Sinedrion's cohabitation alongside the viral invader. However, the virus has displayed no desire to actually coexist with humanity, meaning that Sinedrion's current goal directly conflicts with their stated ideology of respecting individuality and personal freedoms above all else. This is a realization that brings both Adrestia and Barnabas to a virtual standstill, forcing them to acknowledge that life is not easy, and bringing the story to a very uncertain end. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's approach our analysis one step at a time. First of all, it's rather intriguing that this story is told entirely from the perspective of an artificial intelligence. I noted earlier that this, at least in part, seems designed to facilitate the reader's introduction to the modern Sinedrion faction, but it also serves to essentially guide the reader towards understanding what may very well be the faction's most glaring weakness. Barnabas and Adrestia highlight the human tendency towards favoring individual goals and self-serving action over unified action for the greater good. Although they have the best of intentions, the Sinedrion faction essentially personifies these shortcomings, lacking the unity or drive to actually accomplish their lofty goals. Their active encouragement of individual expression and contesting points of view, although admirable, actively hinders the decision-making process. The many brilliant minds that make up the Sinedrion faction are each guided by their own inherent bias and their own preferred outcomes, which in turn guides their individual efforts in a thousand different directions. All three of the stories immediately following The Good Life further explore just how conflicting and sometimes self-destructive Sinedrion's behavior can actually be. Although their technology has allowed them to survive thus far, Stories like Everything is So Much Worse clearly indicate just how much their current attitude gets in the way of their ability to actually deal with the Pandora virus epidemic. This is actually something that's likely to come into play in the game's main campaign. While Sinedrion's technology is certainly impressive, it will probably take the Phoenix Project to actually convince them to start working towards a single, common goal. Otherwise, left to their own devices, they would probably continue pursuing their own individual and often aimless pursuits, only uniting against the Pandora virus once it was far too late to actually make a difference. Another interesting takeaway from the story is the mysterious nature of the Barnabas AI. If we take the story at face value, we can assume that Barnabas is a completely artificial intelligence created and refined by Dr. Marco Matarani. However, there are several details scattered throughout the story that imply that this might not actually be the case. Take, for example, Barnabas's seeming instinctive tendency towards the human frame of reference. He describes the electricity that sustains him as blood and the processes that make up his consciousness as a heartbeat. When his cameras are first activated, he mentions wishing that he could blink, and he later compares his hidden core files to the autonomic systems that sustain the human body. He actually seems to display increasingly human-like behavior as the story progresses, something which Adrestia even comments on, despite his objections. This is something that Barnabas attributes to the fact that his database is filled with information acquired and prioritized by humans, thus giving him a built-in tendency to replicate a human frame of reference. 
However, this appears to be a trait that Adrestia does not share, despite the fact that she presumably draws on that very same database. It's also interesting to note that when Adrestia creates the virtual environment for them to meet in, Barnabas is briefly but significantly disoriented by the simulated tactile sensations that come with it, something which Adrestia claims not to have experienced. It's important to note that while creating Adrestia, Barnabas draws specific attention to the fact that he can't actually access or replicate his core hidden files, the same files which he and Adrestia later agree make up the core of his individuality. Instead, he ends up writing completely new code to essentially fill in the gaps in Adrestia's programming, in effect giving her an identity completely separate from the Barnabas program. This actually leads us to some rather intriguing speculation. In one of the other stories in Briefing Number 5, Imperfect Physiology, also by Dr. Alan Stroud, a Sanhedrion scientist proposes making digital copies of human minds as a means towards preserving humanity beyond its physical extinction. What if Barnabas is actually the result of a similar experiment, a human mind somehow converted into a digital format? Although far from conclusive, this would certainly help to explain some of the stranger parts of the story. Perhaps the earlier iterations of the Barnabas program were simply unable to cope with their new state of existence, leading to the suicidal behavior displayed by version 3.05. Perhaps the restrictions were placed on Barnabas's core files not to restrict his personal freedom, but to instead help protect him from suffering a similar fate. This could potentially put Dr. Matarani's early interactions with Barnabas in a very different light. One of the very first questions that the doctor asks Barnabas is what he remembers, and he expresses surprise and delight when Barnabas refers to him as his creator. Similarly, he also expresses dismay when Barnabas admits to replicating a human frame of reference, or to being aware of his dormant predecessors. While these reactions might not seem out of place, given the circumstances, keep in mind that Dr. Matarani has almost certainly had similar interactions with earlier versions of the Barnabas AI, and yet here he often seems caught off guard by version 3.06's responses. Likewise, he shows no signs of recognizing the report that Adrestia compiled in Barnabas's stead, and seems to grow increasingly concerned as the conversation continues abruptly excusing himself to confer with his colleagues. Now, it's certainly possible that Dr. Matarani was genuinely swayed by Barnabas's ultimately self-serving presentation, but it's also possible that the doctor simply realized that something was out of place. This is actually something that Dr. Stroud himself has vaguely hinted at, implying that Adrestia might be the cause of the sudden tension. Of course, all we know for certain is that both AIs end up featuring in future stories under two very different sets of circumstances. That's a bit outside the scope of this story though, so we'll save those discussions for future videos. Instead, let's wrap things up by talking about what may very well be one of the most curious details of the entire story. The names of the two AI, Barnabas and Adrestia. Early in the story, Barnabas identifies his own name as a reference to St. Barnabas, who, in his own words, was an early Christian missionary who helped bridge the divide between the disparate groups that followed Christ. Although admittedly a stretch, this could potentially be seen as a parallel to Barnabas serving as some sort of bridge between human and purely artificial intelligence. However, it's important to remember that St. Barnabas was also a martyr tortured and stoned to death for his work as a missionary. Despite this, he later appeared in a dream to the Archbishop of Constantia, ultimately leading to a much greater amplification of the message he was originally trying to spread. Again, this could have some rather intriguing parallels with the Barnabas AI, if we assume that it was originally based on a human intelligence, perhaps even someone who died before or during the experiments. More telling, however, is Adrestia, whose name appears to derive from ancient Greek mythology. There, Adrestia was portrayed as the goddess of revenge and just retribution, also referred to as she whom none can escape. Why exactly would that be the name that Barnabas chose for his creation? 
Is it possible that Barnabas is not only based on a human mind, but one that was somehow taken without its former owner's consent? This obviously has all manner of potentially sinister implications, especially in light of the fact that Sanedrion has shown a willingness to use other survivors as unwitting test subjects for their experiments. Of course, that brings us into the next story on our list, Imperfect Physiology, also by Dr. Alan Stroud. But uh, we'll get to that one next time. For now, I think the good life has given us more than enough to think about. That said, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Phoenix Point, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, the official Discord channel, the official YouTube channel, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on Fig. As always, links are in the description.